Carl Eifler stood on the balcony of the Office of Strategic Services office in the city of Algiers, Algeria. Loud honks and shouts rose from the hectic street below. OSS G Director General William Donovan stepped onto the balcony. He closed the door behind him. Eifler had spent the past few months perfecting his plan to kidnap the German physicist Werner Heisenberg and putting together his team for the job. Everything was set, he told Donovan, for my proposed entry into Country X. Carl, there's a change in your orders, Donovan informed Eifler. We have broken the atom secret with our Manhattan Project. We beat the Nazis. Your mission is scrubbed. I see, sir, said Eifler, blinking back tears of disappointment. Donovan assured Eifler that he'd be given a new assignment, one just as dangerous, penetrating Japanese-held territory in Korea. Eifler walked back to the room he was sharing with another OSS operative. Unable to sleep that night, he paced the room muttering, I can't get him out of my mind. I can't get him out of my mind. Who? asked the other man, annoyed at being kept away. The last guy I bumped off, said Eifler. Eifler. Well, the roommate yawned, what can you do about it? Bump off another one. Oh, for heaven's sakes, Carl, turn out the light and go to bed. Donovan had not been truthful with Eifler. The Americans had not yet broken the at atomic secret and did not know if they would beat the Nazis to, to the atomic bomb. Donovan just wanted to take Eifler off the job without hurting the man's feelings. But the job was still on. By December 1944, American and British forces were driving toward Germany from the west. The Soviets were coming on fast from the east. Hitler was about to be crushed until he could pull out an atomic bomb. So it was still necessary, reasoned Donovan, to target German physicists, especially Heisenberg. But Donovan had changed his mind about he Eifler's fitness for the mission, worried the man's loose cannon style could draw unwanted attention to the delicate operation. He gave the job instead to a 41-year-old former baseball player named Mo Berg. Berg had been a mediocre baseball player at best, hitting .243 over 15 big league seasons as a backup catcher. To Berg, baseball had just been a way to make a living. In the offseason, he worked as a lawyer, studied languages, and traveled the world. In 1943, his playing days over, he took his talents to the OSS. Berg was soon assigned to the secret operation, codename As Alsos. The Alsos mission was to follow close behind advancing Allied forces in Europe, searching for any scraps of information about the German atomic bomb program. Berg spent some time in London studying atomic physics. In early December, he was told to report to Paris. Walking the streets, he was spotted by a sports writer he knew from his previous career. The man smiled with surprise and opened his mouth to speak. Don't ask me what I'm doing here, Berg warned. Actually, he didn't know himself. He found out the next day at a meeting at the Ritz Hotel with Samuel Goldsmith, a physicist who was the scientific head of the Alsos mission. Goldsmith told Berg that based on reliable information coming out of Germany, Werner Heisenberg would be leaving the country on or about December 15th, traveling to Switzerland for a scientific conference. He would be giving a lecture at Zurich University on December 18th. Berg explained Goldsmith would be there too. Nothing spelled out, Berg wrote in his notes, but Heisenberg must be rendered hors de combat, combat French for out of the battle. But what exactly was Berg being ordered to do? Neither he nor Goldsmith ever talked publicly about their secret mission referred to in OSS documents as the Swiss Steel. But after the war, Berg confided in a fellow secret agent, Earl Brody. He'd been drilled in physics to listen for certain things. Brody explained, if anything Heisenberg said convinced Berg the Germans were close to a bomb, then his job was to shoot him, right there in the auditorium. It probably would have cost Berg his life. There would have been no way to escape. With his dark complexion and a gift for languages, Mo Berg had the ability to pass for a number of nationalities. On one earlier assignment, he'd been a French merchant, on another an Arab businessman. On the afternoon of December 18, 1944, in D Zurich, Switzerland, Berg was a Swiss student, curious to hear a lecture by the great German physicist Werner Heisenberg. He found the building where, the Heis when, where Heisenberg was scheduled to talk, entered, located the correct room, and hung his hat and coat in the hall. He walked into the room holding a notebook in his hand. Tucked in one pocket was a pistol, and another was a cyanide tablet in case he needed to kill himself before being captured. 
Berg looked around the small lecture hall. There were about 20 people in the room, most of them professors or graduate students. The room was freezing due to wartime fuel shortages. Berg sat in the second row. Heisenberg opened by explaining the basics of a complex mathematical theory called S-matrix, quickly filling the blackboard with a jumble of symbols and formulas. Berg was instantly lost. Don't trouble yourself, called a professor in the front row. We all know that. So Heisenberg moved to, on to an even more advanced description of S-matrix theory. Unable to follow Heisenberg's math, Berg fo focused on the man. Thinnish, Berg wrote in his notebook, heavy eyebrows, sinister eyes. Heisenberg paced as he smoked, a piece of chalk in his right hand, his left hand buried in his jacket pocket for warmth. He noticed the man in the second row staring at him. H likes my interest in his lecture, Berg jotted. If he heard anything that led him to believe Heisenberg was close to developing an atomic bomb, Berg's orders were take, to take out to take the man or his to come combat. He was prepared to do so. But as far as Berg could make out, Heisenberg was talking about a completely different subject. As I listen, I am uncertain what to do, wrote Berg. If they knew what I'm thinking. Heisenberg ent ended the lecture and the other professors and students began discussing his theories. Berg's pistol stayed in his pocket. It was still there a few days later when Berg showed up at a dinner party at a physics professor's house in Zurich. He spotted Heisenberg inside, surrounded by party guests. Talk turned from science to the war, and several of the guests started grilling Heisenberg, demanding to know how he could live and work under Hitler, a monster who enslaved countries murdered Jews. I am not a Nazi, Heisenberg said, defensive, said Heisenberg defensively, but a German. Now you have to admit one guest challenge. The war is lost. Yes, Heisenberg sighed, but it would have been so good if we had won. Many of the guests were disgusted by this, but Berg was glad to hear it. If the Germans were about to finish an atomic bomb, would Heisenberg really believe the war was lost? Heisenberg grabbed his coat and headed for the door. Berg followed close behind, catching up to Heisenberg outside. He introduced himself as a Swiss student, and they walked together chatting in German. The narrow streets were dark and quiet. There was no one around. It was the perfect moment to kill Heisenberg. But Berg had found no evidence that the man really presented a threat to the Allies. Oh, it's so boring here in Switzerland, Berg said, trying to draw Heisenberg into a political discussion. Berg said he'd rather be in Germany fighting the war. Heisenberg d disagreed politely. He said goodnight and walked into his hotel. The next day, he left for Germany. Berg wrote up his report on the mission and sent it to the OSS. Heisenberg's belief that Germany would lose was another piece of evidence suggesting that Hitler was not about to unleash atomic bombs. But it was not conclusive evidence. Heisenberg and the other German scientists were still in Germany, where fission had been discovered. They were still working, but on what? If only we could get a hold of a German atomic physicist, said Samuel Goldsmith, we could soon find out what the rest of them were up to.